And so, yeah, welcome everyone. Good evening. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, we are delighted to have so many people here from all over. Um, just to introduce quickly uh, the speakers today. Well, I'm Jane Solomon, part of Amalgama, along with Daniela Galan. Um, Amalgama is a cultural program based in London, dedicated to promoting and championing the work of women artists from Latin America, from the past, from the present, emerging, reestablished. We do this through art history courses, our Amalgama Academy, through our social media platforms, through group and individual exhibitions, through mentorship publications. Um, I hope a lot of you already know us, but if you don't, please head over to our Instagram at Women Artists Latin America um, and follow us and you'll keep abreast of everything that we do. But more importantly, on to today's exciting um, event that we have this evening, which we're super excited about. We are delighted to be able to have this conversation with the son of the most amazing, phenomenal, fascinating, inspiring artists. I think we're all fans of Leonora Carrington, and we are delighted to be able to have this conversation with Gabriel Vise Carrington today, this evening. So without further ado, I will hand over to Danny, who will conduct the interview. But first of all, just a bit of housekeeping. Um, we're going to keep everyone's mics and videos off for the moment. There will be a chance to ask questions towards the end of the evening of the event. So we'll be about an hour in total. Please feel free to send questions in the chat in the meantime, as and when they come up, and I will convey them to Daniela. Um, and that's it for now. This event is recorded and it's live on, on YouTube. And over to you, Danny. Hi. Gabriel, thank you so much for, for being with us here today. Um, this event is a wonderful occasion, not just to speak about your mother, but your wonderful book, The Invisible Painting, the memoirs that you wrote about your mother, that as I was mentioning to you a while, two minutes ago, uh, it really um, made me wish that one day my son would write some, a book like that about me. Uh, and, and I found it fascinating because often we talk about People tend to talk about Leonora Carrington uh, only uh, her only four years with Max Ernest and her relationship with this realist crowd. And what I love the most about your book is that you go further and you talk about her long life and 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 her relationship with you as a mother, as a creative, as someone that shared this creative experience with you. Um, so I want to start from the beginning. What led you to write this wonderful book and this approach that you give her? Uh, because in a way, some when I read the book, sometimes I feel you're writing to us, the audience, but sometimes I feel you're also writing to her. Um, and, and I wonder if that was an intentional way of you writing the book in, in this particular way. Well, yes, you're quite right. The thing is that, uh, first of all, you see, I was kind of shocked by the way people would write about Leonora, like if she was some kind of a, a rock star, you know, a Hollywood figure. And she was neither, neither one nor the other, you know? So it, she was an artist. But what does that mean, really? You know? Because especially nowadays, that... Uh, Art is so uh, devaluated. I mean, uh, whatever one can observe in museums and so on, it's, uh, as far as I'm concerned, a bloody disgrace, you know, what people call art, no? Uh, so I don't know. There was a moment when uh, art meant something. Huh? I don't know uh, if uh, we're living a kind of dark age or, or what's happening, but I thought that it was very important that people would understand what was the kind of creative process in Leonela. You know? What did she really achieve? Because she was always looking for something. You no, know? And this was what was important about her art. Now, the way the book was written, well, yes, you got it. No, I did. Uh, I was trying to conjure her back into a kind of conversation that sometimes I had with her, but others I didn't. 
So it was important for me to communicate with that person, not as a ghost, but as a very living uh, yeah. Yeah. Hmm? Absolutely. So and I, I got that from, from the, I, 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 I thought of her very much alive. And in a way, I don't know if it's also due to her beliefs that in a way transcended this reality, this physical reality that we, we see and touch. And in a way, her vast imagination allows you to live beyond your senses. And it's something that also your book made me really appreciate it in the way also she raised you perhaps to see how not only our physical senses allow you, allowed us to, to have some sort of truth, one of the, the things that struck, that I was fascinating when reading your book was when she was describing this process of possessing an animal, not maybe not possessing, that's not the right word, like inhabiting an animal and becoming this animal. And then she writes something along the lines, like, if you think what I'm saying is fictional, you're vastly mistaken. So how did that vision um, affected you whilst you were growing up with her as a mother of um, your vision of life on of how you perceive the world creatively in this creative thinking that in a way she conveyed by the way she looked and behaved and produced and wrote how was that as a part of your life as the growing up with her well I think basically she was teaching me how to to relate to to the invisible Okay, it's important to understand that a dog is more than a dog. A cat is more than a cat. And what we see when we look at a tree or a flower is that, that we are sort of uh, blind to the fact that it has a life of its own, a personality of its own. And then the Nora taught us that. And I think Danny also uh, got that from, from the exchange he had with Leonora and with myself as well, you know, that we wanted to bring this kind of invisible reality you know, to something tangible. But it cannot be tangible if we look at it with blind eyes. You know? Facebook, yeah. That reality is, is something that we can look and we can touch, and that's not true. Huh? Reality is much more than that, no? Hmm? Absolutely. One of Exactly. One of the phrases that I love about your book, I don't know if she was the one that wrote it, I, I think so, when she said, how can you get bored? All you need to do is close your eyes. And, and not even like just be in the moment and everything around you appears. And in a way, this is one, one of my frustrations in a sense of solely reading her work within the surrealist perspective, because in a way, the word surreal in, implies something beyond the real, something that is not here, that is related to either our dreams or or an unconscious reality that we might not access every day. But one of the things that I love about both about what you wrote and about her work that I can see both in her paintings and her writings is that that reality was here. Her imagination was here. Everything that was happening was a conscious creation. It was there. Uh, and how you explain even walking as a child and in your trip to Europe, how she would point at a rock and make you think about the fairies and all these wonderful creatures between it, that that derive from her Irish mythology as as if they were there. They were not part of a mystical world that unexisted, but in reality is 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 our reality. So I wonder again, like how how that affected you as an artist as well, because if I'm not mistaken, you also became an artist. Yeah, you know, well, I don't know. You know, I have uh, my qualms about calling myself an artist or not. I mean, uh, you are what you are, and if you create something, uh, it's it has to be for oneself. If you create for other people, then that's a problem, no? Yeah. Because then, then it's when you become something, no? 
So uh, this, uh, uh, I don't know, process of becoming is very, uh, for me, it's a very suspicious and, and false thing. No, it's sort of artificial. No? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So, sorry. No, 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 the idea would be how can we do things you know, without being always, I mean, always depending on, on what other people think about what we do, you no? Know? Yeah. And I think that is very limiting. It's crippling, you no, know, yeah. actually. So, it, and it's impossible to create like that. Actually, uh, one of the greatest enemies of creation is when when uh, people uh, think that you are an artist or that uh, you are a poet or whatever, no? Uh, it's better to, to be uh, in, in a kind of liminal zone mm -hmm. where when you write, you try to write from something real, no? I mean, that part of a, a reality that belongs only to, to feelings, no? When I feel that what I'm doing is true, but true to myself. Yes. Not true for somebody else or for an ideology or for a movement for that matter, no? Hmm? It has to ring true. Absolutely. I think in your book, you you have a phrase that stuck with me a lot, which is this notion of perpetual becoming that you use to to describe some some of the characters of her books. But in a way, I, I feel like it's pretty much her, this perpetual becoming that doesn't become anything in particular, but is the Spanish word that I love, which is devenir, like a, a constant devenir. I don't know, um, maybe that's becoming. I don't know if I would translate it in the same way. But I, I just find this beautiful process of becoming because one one of the things that I, I loved about her is how much she, she rejected this process of categorization um, and how much she was affected precisely of her her background in England in a way that she was meant to follow certain standards. And then also precisely where lies my frustration of circumscribing her work solely to surrealism, because in a way puts it again into a becoming a very specific framework that prevents us from looking forward. Um, and but I, I I want to explore this process and how how was your dialogue with your mom um, relating this beginning of hers in England and coming out and transforming that reality into something else? I think something that you mentioned in your book is that she named you after her father. So this is a relation that in a way ties her back into that past, but um, makes you wonder as well. Uh, this relationship with this beginning and and how did you relate to that as well and in, in your conversations with her well you see the thing is that uh, uh, her life uh, uh, in, in England became a kind of mythical kind of space no because uh, she was imagining a kind of England that no longer existed, no, when uh, when she was in Mexico, and she had to survive in Mexico, and th that meant a great effort for her because it, it, somehow uh, she would always be a foreigner, but to think that. Uh, Array, then your name is English, no? And so on. she was a foreigner there as well. Yes. She was a foreigner in, in her family circle because none of them really understood her till much, much later on. I think she had a, a, a kind of relationship with, with Pat, who was one of my my uncles and Gerard, no, I mean, you, but that was it, you see. Mm -hmm. So uh, that was a problem, no? Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, I felt that too, that in a way she never 
felt from anywhere in particular precisely because she was always becoming something else that prevented her from uh, categorizing herself in a particular way and in a way this is the same way that I, I view her process in Paris despite the fact that one of the most uh, famous paintings of hers happened very early on um, when when she was in Paris surrounded by this surrealist group but in a way a lot of people tend to gravitate around that particular painting that self-portrait that in a way informed a lot of her career but in a way we we tend to stay there and and disregard a lot of her process that happened afterwards when she arrived in Mexico and then in the U.S. with you so I think there, there are so many processes that are are open precisely because of this categorization. And, and before I jump to her process in Mexico, I, I want to go a bit to your dad, because I think your dad is also a, a fascinating person and also her relationship with this realist group, because beyond being categorized or not within this realist group, I think they were a community that actually helped each other quite a lot. And this is a question that I don't know if you discuss with your father um, or not, but when I was reading the biographer, the biography of Remedios Baro, I found it fascinating that it was because of Emerico Chiquivais that she was able to uh, see Gerardo Lizarraga in one of the camps in France and, and thanks to the surrealist crowd was able to free him. So I think this connection of helping each other, this group that in a way transcended arts and it became a friendship that in a way they helped each other and 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 helped navigate very turbulent times. I don't know if if you were your your father talked about this relationship prior to Mexico and with Remedios Baro and this wonderful event that without your father, probably Emerico Chiqui, um, Gerardo Lizarraga would have died. I don't know if you, if you discussed that with him. Well, you see, the thing is that, that uh, we have to kind of create a family. So uh, uh, since uh, uh, well, most of my father's family was, was uh, murdered by the Nazis, no? And my mother was estranged from her family as well. And Remedios was also estranged from, from her, I mean, her Spanish past and so on, and origins and so on. It meant nothing. So what had to be built was a kind of a community that would somehow understand each other or fight each other, because that was as well. It was true as well, no? But those were the things. You see, we lived uh, a life that had to do with the moment. It, it, there wasn't much going back to the past, you know? First of all, my, my father uh, didn't want to speak about, uh, about his experiences in, uh, with the French uh, Vichy, no? The French fascists. That, uh, that that well that, that were his his enemies, no and so on. I mean, it was very difficult to speak about all that, and it was difficult to speak about Morocco when he was uh, kept in a concentration camp there. No, mm -hmm. so it, those were the things that we didn't speak much about. We spoke about books. No, and for example, I had long, long conversations uh, with with Remedios's cats mainly because Remedios would gossip with my mother, and while they were gossiping, I had a very close relationship with the cats, and uh, <laughs> we had a, an interesting exchange of ideas and concepts, very complex concepts because. Most of, most of the cats were mathematicians and also they were very learned, really, no? And, and it's a beautiful animal that um, 
remains in so many artists like Leonor Fini, whom you also met. Did you talk to her cats as well? <laughs> Did you meet Leonor Fini's cats? Did she have cats when you met her? Yes, but at the time, you know, I was sort of uh, far more impressed with one of the parties that uh, I mentioned that in the book, you know, that suddenly a lot of uh, people uh, completely new, you know, burst out of a room dressed as horses. So I was impressed with that more than with the cats at the moment. <laughs> and when you're... It's a it's a beautiful. Did you did you see her afterwards, Leonor Fini, or was that the one and only turn time? Or did you see Leonor afterwards? Because it's amazing the physical resemblance as well between Leonor Fini and your mother. In a way, they they shared maybe uh, uh, this this uh, common soul in a sense that uh, I don't know allowed them to to speak the same language even if it is if it wasn't a traditional language as as we can assume a language is so uh, did you see her again Leonor Fini le later on when you were older no no it was enough to feel this kind of explosive psyche you no know, that uh, Renelius had as well yeah. and, and this kind of strength that uh, I haven't seen in many people, no? I mean, aside from my mother, of course, no? That uh, they had this enormous amount of energy that was not expressed like uh, 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 in the usual way. I mean, they were not kind of uh, very communicative about this this incredible energy that was boiling inside, no? Mm -hmm. but, but that was enough to feel the person with such an amount of energy and life was, uh, uh, to say the least, extremely invigorating, no? Mm -hmm. I imagine, I imagine it must have been absolutely fascinating to be in the same kitchen in Mexico as your house at, at your kitchen where you probably heard the conversations of hundreds well I don't know if the hundreds is a very large number but a lot of uh, one of the the most brilliant intellectuals of the 20th century like uh, Octavio Paz, Remedios Varo, Aldous Huxley, Wilfredo Lam how how did it feel to be part of uh, observing these conversations where did you take part in the conversation as well or were you more of an active listener what was your part within this kitchen uh, that was not just a place of conversation but of bubbling creation how, how was the experience of of that particular kitchen which I, in my imagination it, it was quite magical <laughs> but I don't know how how you experienced it it was a kitchen and it had a uh... Uh, you know, wooden table in the middle, and it was cracked, and the, uh, you know, it was a kitchen. Huh? There was nothing fancy about that kitchen. It was uh, what it was. But the thing is that the conversations were wonderful. Yes, I did participate because I was, I'm not a very good listener, you know, especially when people, you know, have an opinion. I don't care if it was Wilfredo or Fabio or whoever. No. I wanted to participate and I wanted to make them know that I had an opinion and I had a right to my opinion. No. Which is something that you also convey in your book that in a way your mother raised you to be this pair. She never uh, raise you to be in a way like treating you with a bit of condescendence because you were younger but rather the opposite right I don't know if if I got it right from your book that in a way she spoke to you quite face value explaining to you every every bit of her thought process which in a way on the side note it gave me a, a cue on how to talk to my son as well in a sense to in a way raise him to a point where we can have a dialogue even if he's two <laughs> which I found that fascinating and I don't know how was this 
dialogues between you and your mother towards the end of the book, something that really fascinates me, something that I, I personally didn't know, is your active creative collaboration, which I found incredible. So the amount of projects that you work together and the amount of artworks that you created together. I don't know if you can elaborate a bit on that, on this process of creative collaboration that you did between the two of you. Well, yes, it was mainly uh, in a way uh, to, we sort of invented uh, different games and each project was uh, that, a way of playing, a way of understanding through, through enjoying oneself, but at the same time, understanding the language of the other, no? So it's the possibility of listening creatively and having a, a, a creative conversation. And the creative conversation was, was doing things, making things, no? Mm -hmm. Writing as well, because we wrote a play together and, and she helped me also in several projects and I helped her as well. So that was that sort of thing, no? A mutual collaboration. You know, yeah. and which one was your favorite? It was a mutual conversation. Not conversation. Collaboration, no? Yeah, conversation. It makes sense, the, the correction completely. And, and, and do you have a Favorite one of of the of your creations? Do you want have one that you feel particularly proud of? Well, not really. I mean, uh, it was part of of an educational process, if you see my point. And uh, she, without having the pretension of the teacher or the master or whatever, she would teach things through play through conversations, no? Uh, through understanding what was needed, no? From the other. And from oneself as well, because when one teaches something, then one becomes also the one that is being taught. Absolutely. No? You learn more by teaching than any any other way. Absolutely. And um, which is something that has happened to me. The more I teach about this artist the, that I read about and I want to convey this information, well, not information, this creative process about, the more I learn about them uh, and the more I fell in love with them. And, and in a way, in the in the class that we've, I've created about, you know, um, you know I, I find it very difficult to separate her writings from her paintings. Is this something that, she envisioned like this, uh, uh, in a way, a uh, vast created world, or, or am I mistaken in a way? Because I feel like cannot one cannot be read without the other. Uh, I f I find that they they complement each other, they enrich each other, but at the same time, as if they are two two edges of the same sword. I don't know if the sword is the is the, is the right way of saying. What do you feel like? Is it correct by in saying that? She was a creator, more than an artist, a creator that encompassed both writings, uh, paintings, um, plays, uh, every bit of creation that comes from her? No, I think they were completely different. You see, the thing is that uh, as a writer, she had to embody that kind of creation, you know? And as a painter, uh, uh, she became much more of an eye, of an inner eye. And she had to look into different matters, completely different matters. Because you see, the, the thing that uh, if it was created by the same person, uh, it's not enough to to think that uh, there was sort of a bridge between one and the other. Really, it it did happen once once in a while, but only that. But then the paintings had to acquire their own environment, uh, their own perspective. Uh, it it meant dealing with 
completely different things and images and so on. No? Images in a painting are uh, somehow, and they have to deal with space. And space is something that is very difficult to convey in literature. In literature, you become more of an actor of, and you have to embody characters in paintings. I don't think it was so much a matter of embodying. It was more uh, a, a kind of uh, a, a struggle with the visual, no? I can't think of another word. No. Yeah, absolutely. In a way, I I understand what you mean in a sense that it's not that one informs the other, but it, it makes her part of her creative drive that in a way I cannot read one without the other, but not because they necessarily talk about each other, because it's true that they are completely apart. And in a way, the reader of the painting and the, the writing is a different reader in a sense and and at the same time you read what you want to read one of the things that i love about your book is this emphasis that it's impossible to to say this is the right interpretation of her work which is completely uh, right i cannot i i also get really frustrated when someone says this is the interpretation of what is when in reality is an open book even the paintings are an open book of interpretation that each viewer reader uh, observes and undertakes in according to their own background according to their own feelings according to their own auras i don't know according to their own mystical beings but i do feel the, that in a way by reading them next to each other it informs me about the others in a, in a different way especially about how much I can gather of Leonora's sense of humor, which is something that I've learned here in the UK, that by having a British husband, um, I have to explain a lot to my family that he's making a joke. <laughs> and I don't know if that happened as well in Mexico, that they really got her sense of humor and her dark sense of humor that is very... Um, very British in a sense. I don't know if the if if we can assign it to a particular nationality, but it's more of a of a certain language than in a way not a lot of people I feel tend to understand about the humor, the underlying humor that is both in her writings and in her paintings. Uh, I don't know if if you feel that way, or in if in Mexico people have uh, uh, been able to appreciate this humor or not appreciate. The, I don't know if that is the word, but fully understand this sense of humor, this humor, underlying humor in both writings and paintings? Well, you see, humor is also extremely difficult to, to define because uh, it is bound to a certain uh, learning. You have to learn to have this kind of sense of humor because otherwise you look at it like if it, it like like uh, you know it has to be something that makes me laugh. And English humor sometimes not necessarily makes you laugh. Sometimes it just makes you smile. But then that's enough. Yeah. And it's not slapstick, you see. So uh, then there are things that one has to learn about it. And then Lenica created a humor, which was, uh, I don't think it was understood either by, by the English or by the Mexican audience. Yeah. Hmm. It was her own humor. And it was uh, devastating, really, because when, when she, she was a, a, a feminist by right, if you see my point. So whenever somebody tried to compare her you know, to the male counterpart, then, then she would make these kind of very dark jokes that were sort of understood by a third invisible entity. No? Yes. Do you remember which sort of humors would you say? Would you would you say when someone would make that comparison? 
No, I can't, you know, I can't recall the exact words and things like that. No, but I can, uh, I can recall the, the atmosphere around the person that dared to, to speak, you know, uh, thinking that maybe male artists were superior to female, you know, artists or painters or whatever, no? Which is the common stupidity, no? Yes. Yeah, you know. Absolutely. And I, I do feel that. Mm -hmm. I do feel that when I read, for example, The Hearing Trumpet, there's an underlying humor that when I read reviews or writings about The Hearing Trumpet, when people tend to read it with like at face value, they forget about this underlying humor that you can really enjoy that I, even though it's, it's, it's a book that, again, I wouldn't categorize as a surrealist book. But I, I think in her sense, we can we have to create a, a different genre in order to explain what that book is or what her paintings are. Um, but in a way, it, it, it's, it's a book that, as you mentioned, it just puts a smile of her, my face because not just humorous, but very incredibly witty. So you see this underlying, as if, as if unconsciously she is winking <laughs> the eye uh, when I'm reading it. And also I feel similarly when I see her paintings as well. Um, before before we leave, I, I want to for, for us to explore a bit what you mentioned about this very tragical moment in Mexico uh, that made you live this during 1968. I don't know if a lot of people here in the UK know what happened during 1968 in Mexico that was not just 1968, very famous in France, but also very significantly and historically important that made you both leave Mexico at the time. And how was how was how that event affected you as a person and also her and creating this sense of again displacement moving to the United States. I don't know how that affected you as well and, and your relationship with her. Did you travel together to the United States after 1968? Yes. Well uh, yeah the thing is that uh, at the time, you know, you had a you had a fascist uh, uh, government, and it was extremely difficult to to confront that. You no, know? and uh, people got killed, and uh, and we were very active. I mean, uh, we had we were writing against the government and so on and and then we had to flee the country thanks to to Elena Garo because she denounced us and also uh, it was extremely difficult to to keep this from 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 imploding if you say my point no so uh, and then, then we had to make a life in New Orleans. We thought we were going to stay there forever and fortunately it wasn't like that. No? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And you were able to come back uh, afterwards to Mexico as well. How long did you live in, in the United States? Well, for periods of time, you know, I was, I did my, I was studying in the United States and uh, uh, well, there it was about two years or something like that, but there were short spans of time. Mostly it's been Mexico, no? Mm? Of course, of course. And in a way, as you mentioned before, and then in a way she felt also very a foreigner, of course, here in Britain, also there in Mexico. But uh, did she... Did the culture of Mexico transform her artwork in your perspective, or, or not? <laughs> um, I don't know. Well, one has to sort of live with the unseen, if you want, no, in any kind of country that you live. I mean, either you do that, or or you're going to suffer a lot, yeah. no? But uh, the influence that other people had over her art and so on, I think that, and that includes Max Ernst, is non-existent, no? Yeah. 
Yeah, although I do feel like there are process of dialogues in a way. One of the things that the strikes they made the most is this conversation, as you mentioned, with you and her, but also the conversation she had with other artists like Leonard Fini and Remedios Varo. That, for example, uh, something that struck me the most also when reading Remedios Varo's biography is that she, she emphasized, well, her biographer emphasizes on the fact that according to Remedios Varo, they would never discuss each other's paintings, which I found very enlightening in a sense. They, they would discuss everything else, but not each other's paintings. But even so, I feel like there's a, convert, a, a creative, an underlying creative conversation between the two artists that we can observe, despite the fact that they are completely apart aesthetically, but there is an underlying conversation. Um, do you remember that? Do you remember ever uh, them having this creative conversation of, or how were their conversations between Rem Remedios Varo and Leonora Carrington? Well, maybe about books. You know, again, you, that's something that we always forget. We think that uh, artists have to have, you know, very, very creative conversations. And that was not true. I mean, it was, uh, it was like they say in France, papotage. But, you know, that's what it was. So uh, it, it was pain. It was uh, doing things together. It was the pleasure of being with the person, but not going into her art or not. Because art, for at least for Leonel and for Remedios, I'm sure, and for Leonel uh, Fini as well, there, it was something extremely private. Yeah. You know, that had to do with a kind of inner struggle. You, you don't open that to anybody. I mean, why? Huh? Yeah. You want to keep their friendship. Yes. That, that struggle is completely private. Yeah. Uh, creating is, again, very private, unless you want to create with another person, which, as, I, uh, as you pointed out, there are some things that we did together. No? Hmm? Yeah. But and, that was a completely different kind of uh, arrangement because I would respect, you know, her inner privacy and so did she. You know? Yes, and I, I suppose, like, um, if I'm not mistaken, one of the only collaborations, like, that said they had together, I think they wrote a play between the two of them, if I'm not mistaken. Um, yes, but, you know... <laughs> How can I tell you? It was more like a, a kind of eating kind of uh, collaboration, if you want, conversation, as we were terming it uh, before. But that's what it was. I mean, it, it was not as important as people think it could have been. No? Hmm? Yeah. Although there's always this underlying thing. It doesn't have to be, uh, as you mentioned, visible. It could be this invisible conversation that exists between the, the, each other that in a way allows them to permeate their creative <laughs> thinking, even though they might not be sharing it with them directly. Because definitely there are some sort of and then, for example, there are beautiful correlations between Leonora Carrington and Leonora Fini during uh, their time together in 1939, 1940, with their writings and paintings, even though it's not, they were not discussing them necessarily direct to one another, but this um, cohabitation in a way. I read the other day an article that I found fascinating is the fact when two individuals are next to each other, their neurological system get in sync. So in a way, just by sharing the experience with one another in a way, they their creative uh, environment in a way uh, coincide uh, and, and, and absolutely. So how I want to finish, I want to finish in a way, 
just briefly because we want to also open for questions. Uh, if we have questions by the audience, if they have a particular question to you, we're in, in YouTube. We have a few people in YouTube right now because it's. Uh, I can see that our audience have divided. Some have gone to YouTube and some are here in, in, in Zoom. Um, so we do want to invite the audience if, you, if they have particular questions to you and invite them to know why and where is this invis invisible painting that you wrote in your book that I'm not going to ask you about because I think the readers might need to read the book in order to find out about this invisible painting that you wrote about her, which I found also fascinating. Um, but I do want to finish with this quote that you mentioned, um, again, regarding her relationship with surrealism, that she said that, that you said I don't know, I just want to read it directly because I found it very beautiful and maybe you can elaborate on the quote a bit as well. You say, Leonora did not adhere to any specific political ideology. Rather, her politics were a direct opposition to injustice. Her life was a long struggle to achieve liberty as a woman and as a painter. Her feminism was therefore very personal, opposing the bourgeois English institutionalism that had a uh, threatened to deform her childhood and adolescence. And this is the part that I like the most, hers was a politics of the self, quite different from off in vogue masculine, masculine repertoires of muses, enfants and eroticism that appears in so much other surrealist artworks as a way of expressing strangers. My mother rebelled against these metaphors for female otherness. So in a sense, the, the real question that I want to finish with is, how do you see this question of whether or not your mother's work could be read within this realist category and how much does it add value or not or actually removes value from her work this categorization well earlier on you were speaking about about mexico and so on and i think i re i'm rethinking that that question you you know you brought up the thing is that uh, Lenore was forced to find, if one could say this, uh, her own quote unquote surrealism. This was a surrealism that was brought by, by that lack of practically everything. I don't know, it's a surrealism that has to do with lack. That's the only way I could define it. No? Mm -hmm. What do you mean by that? It's a very profound sentence, but I think I want I wonder if our audience understood what you mean by is a surrealism that means by lack. Does that mean that other surrealism was not like that either? No, because most of the of the surrealists we know, at least, no, belong to to a country, belong to a group of friends, and so on and so forth. And the world was very much alone. So mm -hmm. this was a kind of a struggle, no, with her language. So her surrealism had to express, no. Uh, this kind of uh, of eternal unrest, yes, distance from what from where Breton was, from where uh, Fini was when she was alive, uh, etc. No, mm -hmm. so she had to build this very tight knit cocoon mm -hmm. where she would create. Uh, a, a, a special understanding. Surrealism was uh, uh, gave her a kind of language, mm -hmm. but language is not enough to create uh, poetry or a novel, okay. as we all know. Huh? Mm -hmm. So uh, she had to struggle with it. No, she had to struggle with that kind of language to make her own language there uh, and she was ferociously individualistic so that's what she wanted no 
Hmm? Yeah. With, with a voice. Hmm. Hmm? Absolutely, because it's as you say on the book, hers was a, a pursuit of the self, of understanding herself. Um, uh, and and how she can how can how can art for her allow her to her know better herself? So the rest, it doesn't matter. It's just a, it's a, it's a very internal process. Uh, there are two questions from, from YouTube, actually. Uh, and I'm just going to give voice to uh, Jane so she can, she can read them. Um, so one, the first question is from Jupiter Sending. My question is, did your mother flatten the curve, if you know what I mean? Looking at her paintings, I have the impression that they cannot be understood without knowing that she did. Thank you. That she did flatten, flatten the, the curve. curve. Oh, dear. What does she mean by flattening the curve? Maybe Jupiter can write in, in the chat what you mean by that. But the next question then is, who is your favorite artist and what is your fondest memory of Leonardo? Well, the thing is that I, I, I have so many painters that I love, you know, that it would be very difficult for me to tell, to tell you, okay, uh, this is my favorite artist. Uh, well, I was born with those images. So um, it's a complete, it's not a matter of liking, it's a matter of living with it. Oh, um, uh, but yeah, that was mainly it. So, that, so who would be the artist you cannot live without? And that includes writers. Or oh, more difficult question, never mind. <laughs> but then the second part of that question is, what is your fondest memory of Leonora's? Uh, again, I think it, it would have to do with my fondest memory of Leonor was living with Leonor. Huh? So, yeah, that's wonderful. Mm -hmm. This is a very personal question because also my, my father passed away uh, 10 years ago. But do you feel she's still alive? No. No? No, she's not alive. No. Uh, no. In a way, for me, it is. It's what you mean by alive. Okay. Yeah, it's what you mean by alive. In, in the invisible world, she, she is. For me, the same as my father. But, there is well, another question. Each time I uh, read something of hers, each time I see her paintings and so on, well, something comes alive. That's true. Hmm? And then the other question is from Shia B. Did your mother ever speak of her experiences of that being institutionalized during the period of her life discussed in Down Below? Not really, no. No, it, well, that was, again, you see, something as painful as well was uh, my father's imprisonment in, in the... French camp in Morocco, no? There are things, those are things that you have to digest again mm. in a very private space that is not even open to a conversation with people whom you love, no? mm -hmm. So those are things that usually are kept, you know, silent, mute, no? Did you so discuss... Yeah. Each any one of your her books in particular with her while she was writing with them or not? Well, I, I, again, again, I I missed the first part of you. So, did you discuss any of her books with her while she was writing her writing them or not, or or she would not discuss her books while no. she was writing them? No, you know, sometimes we would speak about certain images but it was not you know something that we we preferred to collaborate with each other not and 
and keep that kind of conversation, the creative conversation with something that was being done at the moment, you know? Mm -hmm. uh, we had to live in the moment. It, it, it was impossible to go, you know, into the past and, and recollect about this or that. Yes, she spoke occasionally of her life in England or, or, or in France and so on, but it, it, it was, you know, it was only once in a while, no? Of course. So we have the another... next... Oh, question. Oh, no. Yeah, yeah. I'm going to carry on with the YouTube questions. Would Leonora paint in silence to music or, or in conversation, I suppose, with yourself sometimes? Is there a time of day that she preferred to paint in? Again? Again. Would she paint in silence or would she paint listening to music? Oh, yes, yes. She, she enjoyed uh, Carla Olaf specifically no hmm? and is there a time of day that she preferred to paint in sorry and was there a time of day that she preferred to paint in no whenever she had the inspiration yeah the, you know a specific time for that i mean uh it would pop out like that and then she would do it ah, and it was also the the irish rebels were very much in the you know, the musical environment as well, no? Usually, how long would it take for her to finish a painting? Well, it, it much depended on the size of the painting and so on, but it was maybe two months, three months sometimes. Um, how did writing this book help you process your mother's death? It didn't. I'm still very sad. Of course. Yes. Um, then this next question is, I think there's a word missing, but I'm going to try and understand it. What would your, oh, no, sorry, what would your advice from Leonora, your Leonora advice be to artists who are still finding themselves in their creative journey? Well, first of all, I'm, I'm not a, a, a spiritist. <laughs> It would be extremely difficult to do that. No? So what would your advice be then? <laughs> my, my advice would be to just tell them carry on and that's it. <laughs> Keep on going. Yes. Your your son mentioned the book, the dark book, uh, as a one of the projects that you collaborated, that you conversed with one another. Um can you can you tell us about this this book before we wrap up? Well, you see, that was uh, again something very interesting because somehow Leonora would create an image, then I would have a conversation with that image, then sometimes I would start the conversation with a poem and she would answer visually, no? So there's not a kind of uh, thematic uh, 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 environment there at all. It's sort of a, a, a conflict between one voice and the other voice. Mm -hmm. It was sometimes a discussion, sometimes it, it was part quieter, you know, maybe a kind of whisper, no? Mm -hmm. Do you know it, where we could see, because that's a, sort of a, as an artist book that you created between you two, right? Do you know where we can see it? Like what, where could the public see it or appreciate it, you know? That's going to be very difficult because it's only been sold as as a as an object, as an art object. No, it's it's a, an art object, of course. Huh? Mm -hmm. And and it's part of a private collection, is it? it well, it, there are some people that have the book, you know, mm -hmm. but uh, most people don't understand the book at all. So, because they want to buy it as a, as a, 
you know, as a painting, and they would like to, uh, you know, to sort of exhibit the book, you know, in a public fashion, so that people can say, oh, my God, you have a little more, this and that. And, and, and the book does not lend itself for that kind of, uh, you know, exposure. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, um, I can't see any more questions on YouTube. Okay, here, here, and so we, we, before we wrap up, we, we want to, we have some exciting uh, news, both from our end and your end, <laughs> that we, we would like to share with you. So I don't know, Jane, you want to start with our end, and then we give voice yeah. to Deb. In uh, Danny, maybe you could share the screen. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, do you see it? Uh, it said started sharing. There it Can is. You see? Yes. Yeah, that's very nice. Mm. <laughs> so as I said at the beginning, uh, part of Amalgama, well, our mission is to champion, promote, and share the work of amazing, incredible women artists from Latin America with the world. And so in our part of the, how we do that is through our art history courses in our Amalgama Academy. Um, the courses are focused on artists from 20th century. No, carry on, move if you okay. want. <laughs> the courses are focused on artists in the 20th century, men and women, but heavily focused on female artists. And um, you can study a specific artist, you can study a movement, or you can study the whole course of six modules. Um, they are given by Daniela Galan, art historian, art society accredited lecturer, uh, who really, really conveys her passion and research through these courses that are online, that you can take in your own time, at your own pace, from your own home or from your phone as you're out and about. So one of the masterclasses that we have on offer is obviously on the amazing, incredible Leonora Carrington. And for today, uh, we are offering you the chance to, if you sign up to the Leonora Carrington Masterclass, you can get another class for free of your choice on, for example, Frida Kahlo, Deborah Arango, Remedios Baro, Wilfredo Lam, Aurora Reyes, um, and there are others, aren't there, Daniel? Yes. I can't think of them at the moment. Torres Garcia, Joaquin Torres Garcia. Eh, Tarsila Amaral, Anita Malfatti, we, we have a list that we increase with time uh, because we have new classes added regularly as we continue to provide new, new contexts and new, new short courses. So um, keep in touch because your favorite artist, if it's not already there, will come up <laughs> eventually. And of course, our main focus on is, is women artists, but that doesn't mean that doesn't mean that we don't include men like we feel Lam. Um, so here you can access the, the Leonora Carrington Masterclass. It's divided in several videos that you can watch at your own pace. They tend to last between half an hour to an hour. Hers is about 48 minutes. And we delve into deeper into specific artworks, uh, in her case, also writings, which I am fascinated about. <laughs> because, uh, again, for example, The Hearing Trumpet was a novel that I <laughs> enjoy pretty much reading. And I, I could not... Uh, speak about it, for example. Um, but each class is distinct and each class uh, has a bit of their life story, but also a critical reading about each one of their artworks and also, each of their creative processes, which for me is really important to open questions, to create new narratives about them uh, that encourage more research, because in my perspective, loads more research needs to happen. And this is what we want, for more people to read about them, write about them, research about them um, because they are so vastly fascinating that this is our mission to share them with the world. And I know um, a lot of people have already done that by with Leonora Carrington, but I think again, it's it's an artist that deserves even more so. So this is, this is our recommendation to people. So they continue to uh, delve into her work and, and discover the wonders that lie. And uh, a little bonus is that our classes come in English and or Spanish. So you can get them in either language or you can practice either language as well. So if you haven't had time to copy the QR code, uh, our, our website is artamalgama.com. 
Um, so you can access the courses on there. And if you have signed up for this event, you will receive an email with the link to the offer that we're offering to you today. And uh, with that, we want to give also uh, the voice to Dan before we finish. So to give us the last um, uh, news about what's coming up with the uh, Gay Raw and uh, the Leonora Carrington Foundation and the wonderful work that you're doing as well. Dan? Uh, Well, send him a little message. Hey. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Sorry, I, I think it's not letting me share video right now. Oh, no, no, no. Yes. Give me two seconds. Uh, no worries. Second. And, and we'll let you, because we, we do want you to start your video. <laughs> and there you go. There Great. You go. Well, we have a couple of uh, exciting bits of information. The first is that we're finally working on uh, the tarot deck, this uh, new edition to be uh, published. We're just getting all the colors right and making sure everything is as close as possible to the original. So it's a, a task of love that uh, my father has definitely embarked upon. So that's in the works. And we also have... Uh, all of Leonora's artwork that is going, uh, sorry, the, all of the uh, writings for her theater that are already out in French, but they're also going to be out in English and Spanish coming out soon. And um, we'll keep uh, everybody updated on the Instagram. So if you don't follow us, you can follow us at Leonora Carrington Estate and we'll keep you updated with all sort of new things coming out that have to do with Leonora. Fantastic. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you, Dan. I think uh, a last question that someone just posed just now, uh, and maybe with this we wrap up because I think this would be a wonderful question to end this with, is how did growing up with Leonora shape your imagination and view of the world? Well, mainly uh, she uh, insisted upon my own imagination and no shaping here or there you see the thing is that uh, you you have to uh, become an individual and that's a very hard job you no know? so that has to be done with a little bit of help of course you no know? but no shaping no no she was too busy shaping herself <laughs> Amazing. Beautiful. Well, that's great because she allowed you to have your own voice, which is fantastic. Yes, yes, yes. There was a, an enormous respect for, for the individual, for the person. No? That's wonderful. Well, thank you again so much to you, Gabriel, for this wonderful conversation about your book and your mother. Uh, we will share with you also the link with the book if you want to purchase it as well and thank you all for joining us the we for the ones that were not able to join us today and registered for the event you will receive the recording so you will be listening to the recording tomorrow so thank you again um thank you and thank you Danny, so much love you feliz noche feliz noche bye-bye <laughs>